our next speaker is Grant Blaisdell. So Grant, um, you have been creating ventures at the intersection of new technologies between the US and Europe since your late teens. You were an early innovator in applying blockchain technology to various industries. The companies you've co-founded include the leading blockchain analytics and AML company, Coin, uh, Confirm, and the marketplace for digital space assets and companies, Copernic Space. Uh, by applying innovative models and technologies such as blockchain, Copernic Space makes digital space assets such as satellite imagery or even fractional ownership of a satellite accessible and easy to acquire for millions around the world. Space enterprises can easily manage and monetize their digital space assets and applications in one place, while the global market benefits from an easy way to discover, acquire, and access them. Uh, you were the third generation in your family to be involved in space. Grant, you've been engaged with the space economy since childhood, and you're the mind behind the model fueling Copernic space and also the president of the Lady Rocket Foundation. I'd love to hear more about that as well. So welcome to the Mars Coin Expo, Grant. Thanks for having me, James, and, and thanks to the whole Mars Coin team for, for allowing me to come on and speak about Copernic space and, and how we're applying you know, blockchain and crypto towards the space economy. So once again, thanks for having me, guys. Uh, James, you gave some good background on me. Uh, quick aspect to add to that. So. Um, I had my first startup when, 19, when I was 19. I'm originally from Southern California. I've been focused on uh, distribution and monetization platforms for digital media and content, which at the end of the day, whether we're speaking about satellite data or a song, uh, we're actually talking about intellectual property formatted in some digital format and packaged. Right. So actually what you're going to see in the future is that the platforms that service your favorite musician is going to have a lot of similarities in the in the back end and the engine of of the platforms that service the space economy. But at Copernic Space, we're here to bring people a place where they can access space and also, even more importantly, in a sense, own a piece of space. So that uh, as it is today, it's not segmented and blocked off to a few list of companies, governments, and uh, billionaires. Oop. Right, and what, what do we believe really at the end of the day with this? So we're solving problems that myself and my co-founder actually experienced. But at the end of the day, we wanna open up and give a promise for the space economy. For example, that crypto has given to millions around the world, which is, hey, I'm not in a position to uh, invest into SpaceX. I'm not an accredited investor. I don't have $1 million to throw at a startup. I'm not putting money into a VC fund that's investing into space, right? These very limited avenues to where you can actually invest and be a stakeholder in the space economy. So we're gonna be providing not only a platform, but the models and capabilities for you know, an 18 year old kid with $100 to invest that into the space economy. You guys know just as well as I do the size of the market already and how big it's gonna be very soon. Uh, so I threw a few numbers there to show how big some of these segments are already, uh, how, much, um, how much energy is needed for these companies to actually find what they need. So you see that 100,000 companies actively looking for better access. And then obviously you can see that just in the past year, um, investments, formal investments in the space economy went up 356%, right? So we really wanna tap into this, A, massive market, uh, B, this big thirst and need to have better access to it, and on the flip side, open up the floodgates for the financing um, of the space economy. We believe that, yes, the space economy is already $400 billion plus. We actually believe it's already a trillion dollar market. It's just no one is facilitating uh, the access and transfer of assets between uh, parties, which leads to this space bottleneck. So at the end of the day, we're looking to solve what we see as the two of the largest problems in the space economy which is A, there is no market. Like I said, $400 billion plus uh, market. 
but there is no central point to engage, uh, request, acquire, manage, and access all these space assets, right? So there's people on you know, the panel here that I speak to that are looking actually for a place that they can more easily, more directly commercialize their space assets, whether it's payload space or satellite data, and also something that we're seeing emerge a lot, uh, something that Copernic Space has really been a, a groundbreaker at doing, which is what we call alternative space assets. So you might have seen this the other week with what Space Force did around NFTs, right? Uh, at Copernic Space, we've done similar things with NFTs, but focused on a little bit different aspects like the past week. Uh, we released the Satellite Rhino NFT series, which uh, the funding that comes from that goes to finance better satellite operations to help Saving the Survivors, which is a, um, a well-known organization on the ground in, in uh, South Africa that fights poaching and saves endangered animals. And they're still using, for the most part, quite archaic technology and better uh, and more streamlined access to satellite imagery and data would totally change that. So we really also want this marketplace to serve to have really profound effects uh, on Earth as well, right? So we've had a big influx of actually space companies coming to us not to just say, hey, we want to commercialize our space assets better, more directly, discover new types of end users, etc. But can we find a way to monetize and provide liquidity to us, operational liquidity with what we call alternative space assets. So these could be, you know, like uh, posters, these could be the first uh, screw on the first rocket that we launched, right? Uh, and you're gonna see a, you know, a multi-million dollar market emerge over the next few years just around these alternative space assets, while at the same time, we're already servicing the countless billions of dollars market of traditional space assets. The other one, no liquidity. Um, this is any space entrepreneur knows this struggle. This is one of the key drivers why we created Copernic Space because we ran into this. Uh, you asked about Lady Rocket Foundation. Lady Rocket is my mother. And my mother and I have been active in the space economy for a while on the ground dealing with entrepreneurs and trying to get financing also for our own stuff, right? Even though I'm someone who has created successful ventures in the startup space, been dealing with VCs for 14 years at this point, it's even hard for me to go through those processes with a space company, let alone a you know, general space company with you know, genius guys, but focused on building and solving very specific issues. And just like with the market, aspect are not very good, for example, at dealing with this VC or this investor, just like a lot of times they're not very good at discovering and dealing with, you know, these new types of end users like agriculture companies or insurance companies, right? So we're looking to, to solve that aspect. And, and, you know, generally, if you're early stage, you got government grants. And if you're lucky, you can find an investor VC to risk that. But that's very rare to find that second one. Right. And even if you're a guy like Elon Musk, what's he doing right now? He's selling shares to SpaceX. He's doing that almost every year, uh, every year and a half or so. Why is he doing that? Well, he's doing it quite quietly most of the time. So he's not doing it to raise the valuation really and show that to the world. A lot of times he seems to be doing it for what? For liquidity. Right. So what's his deal? He has to go to VCs for it. Well, guess what? He has hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of contracted guaranteed revenue coming in that he can't leverage towards any sort of liquidity, just like a lot of brick and mortar businesses do, you know, on the ground. So we're going to unlock all of that, right? First, by addressing the marketplace aspect. Um, this whole platform is blockchain based and enabled. We're non-custodial and non-intermediary when it comes to data, transactions, and funds. What we do control, and we are a central marketplace in this sense, is we control who, uh, what organizations or companies uh, enter the market, so KYC, right? And I have six years of regulatory background around crypto, so I'm, I'm pretty well versed at this aspect. And then a process we call KYM, Know Your Materials. This is an internal standard we're creating at Copernic Space which we hope uh, will become an industry standard, which what we're doing in KYM, 
uh, for both the Space Mart as well as the other section that you'll, you'll see soon, is we're validating whether this entity has the commercial rights and capability to execute what it wants to execute on the platform. We are gonna streamline this process so that it, it doesn't delay things and, and create it as fast as possible, uh, make it as fast and efficient as possible. But uh, quality and rights have to be controlled on this marketplace. It can't have a full on DeFi crypto approach. So on the Space Mart, what it's separated actually into two halves, um, which I'll get into the next slide, which is suppliers, uh, supply and demand. But we're gonna provide a place to where whether you're a space company or let's say you're this agriculture company that wants to acquire sp space assets, you can come on there, you can acquire them, you can manage them and access them all in one place. And what you see in the second point there, which I'll get into in our actual commercial cases that are coming out, is we're going to allow to create divisible and resellable space assets, which in turn will create from what we can tell the first true uh, secondary market for space assets. I can share this presentation, James, with you so that people can go in and click play here so they can see actually how the product is looking and, and kind of working in a general sense. Like I said, it's segregated into two halves. First one is supply side. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. So take example of like uh, payload space, right? So I have payload space. I'm approved on the platform. Uh, I go through the KYM. And now what do I want to do? I'm going to make an offer on the marketplace to sell, let's say, one kilo of payload space on my rocket that's going somewhere. And I'm making that generally accessible to the public, right? Within that offer, when I create that offer, I can embed within that offer all the rights and direct access to whatever data sets are needed for that, uh, that are related towards that offer. In this case, what's actually happening is when they create that offer, it's creating an NFT. And within that NFT are embedded all that metadata, all those rights, et cetera. And in this case, what, what they could do is they could make that one kilo, that NFT, divisible and resellable so that the person who acquires it um, can actually divide it, let's say, in 100 grand portions and then resell it to other entities, right? Uh, but what's actually happening there is that they're registering it. That creates a certain tokenized asset that's tied to their identity of ownership. And on the basis of that, they can create these offers, right, which are actually NFTs. So what the other entity does comes on the marketplace, it discovers this offer, and let's say it acquires that kilo, what's actually happening is they're putting in the funds. Uh, it can be crypto, but it can also be dollars. We're creating a gateways for this because we're not going to be forcing space companies or, you know, agriculture companies to be playing around with, you know, the crypto aspect, which is quite abstract. And in some ways, you know, from a, from a regulatory compliance end is not very easy or possible for a lot of these entities. Uh, but they provide those funds according to the offer that hits the smart contract. It transfers the NFT over. They're getting the NFT. They don't need to know it. They don't really know it. Uh, the, it provides them all the benefits that it does have. And then they are the sole rightful owner of uh, this payload space through this NFT. And then they can chop that payload space up, like I said, and resell it if the original seller wants to do that. Right. So supply side is quite simple. You know, it can be the same thing with a data set. I have this data set. I get it registered in my ownership and I make as many offers as I want for that same data set on the marketplace. Entities discover it, acquire the NFT and then can access that data set directly through the NFT. Right. Because you can place the actual direct pointer into that data set, whether it's uh, whether it's, let's say, um, AWS, which a lot of the space industry is on. So we're talking with AWS right now to create a tokenized entry point for NFTs or to more of these kind of, you know, distributed P2P um, uh, kind of distributed systems, right? What we really find to be the holy grail, what's going to be the holy grail of all this, which we think is going to be about 90% of the activity on the commercial market is going to be the demand side which we're working with some really great partners around solving this, which means, let's say I'm an agriculture company. I come on Copernic Space and I put in a request. I say, hey, I need this sort of data and this sort of format and this sort of standard. 
What we do, once again, we're non-custodial, non-intermediary, we're a facilitator. Look at us as what eBay provided to digital retail on global scale, or even Amazon in some sense. Look at it that way. We're bringing e-commerce to uh, the space economy. So what they would do is they would, put, they would put in that request. We funnel that request to the supply side, all these suppliers here. And one of the suppliers fulfills that request, you know, creates the NFT and they execute that, uh, execute that deal through a private offer, right? That doesn't have to go publicly on the marketplace. But this is what we really think is going to provide the true application and scalability, especially of satellite data and imagery. Right. And we're working with some some hedge funds and some satellite data companies to really break down these barriers. It's a very complex problem to to solve, as I'm sure you guys know, it's a very segmented sort of market, lots of different providers, lots of different standards. And we're really looking to standardize a lot of these things uh, in the market. Right. The second half. Remember, the second problem. Space pool is our answer towards the liquidity problem. Uh, I spent I've spent eight years functionally now in the blockchain economy. I'm not talking about, hey, I bought Bitcoin. I'm saying building ventures and products. Uh, and because of what I did at CoinFirm, we were the first ones to able to analyze Ethereum and ERC tokens. So I've been able to work with about 70 ICOs uh, over the years and understand that market very well and understand the regulatory aspect about it. And the space pool is also going to be divided into two sections. At the bottom there, you see from dedicated token sales to our liquidity pool, right? So what are we talking about with the liquidity pool? Um, remember that example I gave with Musk earlier? So once again, he's got hundreds of millions of dollars of contracted revenue that he seemingly can't leverage for fast liquidity. So we're revolutionizing the idea of the liquidity pool in crypto and actually funneling it into some sort of functional usage outside of just leveraging it for uh, you know, asset to asset exchange. Uh, so this is in some, some regulatory clearance and legal processes right now, this part of the space pool, which is the liquidity pool. So this allows contracted space companies like SpaceX uh, to come on Copernic space uh, go through the KYM process with uh, a contract or a con or contracts plural, and leverage that guaranteed contracted revenue to pull out liquidity fast at a agreed to interest rate out of our liquidity pool. So what actually technically happens is we open this liquidity pool to the global market. Uh, they put in their funds and lock them. We act as almost an administrator in this sense. So the space company locks down the terms with us, set in a smart contract. We provide them that liquidity fast. The liquidity providers get tokens called proof of liquidity, which let's say I have 10 million in these contracts. I wanna leverage it to pull out $1 million at a 10% interest. So we're gonna put in 1 million, uh, we're gonna put in 11, sorry, 1 million, 100,000 back in right, in six months. When they put that 1,100,000 back in, uh, all the people with, uh, who provide liquidity get notifications to that and then are able to exchange their rightful proof of liquidity tokens uh, for the liquidity they provided plus the interest, right? So this is going to uh, really push um, this bottleneck you see, because listen, I, I don't know how many of you have gone through VC rounds. It's horrible. It's usually about six months. It's full-time work on top of the full-time work you already have. Uh, you're dealing with people who are there a lot of times trying to leverage things and take as much of your pie as possible and implement themselves within your operations. If we provide contracted space companies who are already doing things, the capability to within hours pull out the liquidity that they need without having to deal with all that side stuff, then we've just added a whole different type of fuel uh, to the rocket of the space economy, right? On the flip side, you have all these other types of ventures, early stage or lady rocket foundations or projects like Spaceborn United, which is a partner of ours, which does R&D for human reproduction in space, right? These are 
these are things that generally only the public and these kind of non-interest sort of things can fund. And then you have the actual startups, right? How does a guy who's building, uh, who wants to build a uh, asteroid mining rig, where's he gonna get that initial fundraising from, right? So based on you know, our capabilities, understanding of you know, the token sale market, we're going to launch the other half of the space pool is gonna allow you to directly finance specific projects, right? Showcase them. They have a certain model that they apply there. We're going to provide three tokenization models. Uh, one is called kudos for now. So that's, that's us actually gamifying non-interest or charitable giving. My long-term hope is to have NASA on it so that they can, uh, so that the American public can choose uh, to finance NASA projects, et cetera, and take it out of the hands of um, you know, our wonderfully, usually incompetent uh, people within the U.S. government who decide the budgets of NASA, for example. But it can be anything, like I said, from Spaceborne United to a foundation like Lady Rocket to, to NASA. Second one is utilities. So this will allow, for example, let's say a satellite company to fundraise for creating and launching their next satellite without having to go through a VC round and sell their equity. So they can, for example, tokenize the actual satellite itself, uh, sell that these tokens as having utility access to privileged data sets, let's say, right? Or last but not least, security tokens, right? So that's equity, that's some of these kind of royalty uh, aspects. And the one that I just brought in, you can flip that model and you can tie those tokens to the future revenue generated by that satellite, right? So token holders have rights to revenue generated by that satellite and therefore that satellite company within uh, days or, or weeks can fund its satellite and, and not have to deal with a VC or investors, et cetera, right? So uh, different people get excited by different halves of this platform, whether it's the space mart or the, or the space pool. Um, but we're really leveraging these crypto models and not just the technology, but really these models to, to fuel all these great entrepreneurs, uh, you know, some of these people are sitting on, on, you know, on the panelists with us right now um, to put that fuel on their rocket that they need to accomplish their mission and do it much faster. Because guys, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you can take all the VCs, you can take all these governments, you can try to focus their funding into the space economy, but it's not enough. And and by the way, VCs, models, and mandates don't work for the space economy, for early stage space ventures. It just does, doesn't. It's a broken model. They'll ask you, well, we'd like to see some revenue or some sort of traction. It's like, well, if I'm a space company and I'm generating revenue, I'm, that VC is not in, can't get in at an early stage anymore. So it's a fundamentally broken system that we're looking to fix, and we know how to fix it because we've done it ourselves. Uh, engine in the background. This mainly applies to the the Space Mart. Um, I'm kind of I kind of keep things a little bit more hidden around the Space Pool because as a, if you've been around crypto for a long time, I'm sure you know there's a bunch of people who would take that and they would just scam it and raise money publicly <laughs> off you know any sort of details I would give. Um, but as you can see here in this engine, uh, you can see very clearly how we are able to take, let's say, a satellite data process and break down those barriers and those walls and those segmentations and really make it in a trusted peer-to-peer -peer, uh, environment. So here you can see the, you know, the seller creates that asset, uh, they create that license, which we call smart offers. Um, that, that token is acquired and then directly through it, they can access the server you know, through a cloud or IPFS or let's say a native sort of database where it's being held. Um, we're working with some really great partners to also add um, a secondary layer to this, uh, which kind of eliminates some of the aspects that traditional blockchain protocols provide uh, around this. Um, and hopefully, you know, next time I get to speak to you all, I can, I can provide more details on that. So commercial case launches. Um, first one, this is in about four months. We're going through some regulatory checks and clearances right now, which will be the first ever tokenized offering of payload space. 
And this is on a rover that's going to the moon uh, next year. And we also hope, uh, this is part of the regulatory clearance, that we can do divisible, naked divisible and resellable. Meaning, once again, let's say they sell, you know, one kilo to someone, they can allow that person to chop that, kilo, that NFT up into 10, let's say, smaller NFTs of 100 gram portions and resell those and set within the original uh, NFT that any sort of resell, Lunar Outposts will get a revenue share off of. Right. So, you know, this could be sold a hundred times, resold a hundred times. Lunar outposts would have automated procurement of those 100 transactions and an agreed to share of them. Technically, the second launch case we have about four to six months once we pass through the regulatory aspect is the liquidity pool of the space pool. So <clears throat> that's going to be big next four to six months. Uh, if we launch the thing with Lunar Outpost well and that liquidity pool, we definitely and permanently change the landscape of the space economy. You can see the second one there. This is with a great company, Exodus Orbitals, uh, that does uh, satellite software. So they have planned launches with uh, ESA uh, next year. Um, that has their software on the satellite that allows you to quote unquote rent the satellite. So we will actually be creating NFTs, which are pretty much licenses to uh, orbits per orbit rental uh, of it. And we'll also hopefully allow for the divisibility and resale of that. Cause let's say I buy an orbit, but I only want to use half of it because the pictures that I want to take are in that half of the orbit. I'm not going to use the other half. So why not resell it? Right. Where we are today, uh, we're EVM based. Uh, a lot of the success I've had, for example, coin firm had, et cetera, was building on the basis of blockchain agnosticism or cross chain ability. Same thing in Copernic space. Uh, we're based on EVM as when it comes to full launch, uh, we want to have as much flexibility as possible. Uh, obviously, we're not going to launch on Ethereum mainnet, the full on product, because it's just not a scalable, you know, commercially viable uh, chain when it comes to what we're trying to do. Right. Um, so you, you see some other details in there, what we're capable of doing right now. And you also see some more use cases at the bottom. If, you know, different people get excited by different ones. I find it really fascinating how people react to ones, you know. We had a VC just love the space mining one, right? And then another one who just loves the, the rover, for example. And then another one who loves the space pool. At the end of the day, though, what, the, what we're trying to say with this is that within the next four to six months, you know, as, as long as we get through the regulatory aspect and we launch this, you're going to see, you know, the, the marketplace for the space economy change drastically with the precedent that we set. Business model, we're straightforward. Uh, once again, non-custodial, non-intermediary uh, when it comes to this aspect. So we have a percentage of each transaction set in the smart contract. Uh, I brought in my head of data from CoinFirm uh, to start building, you know, together we built the largest private structured blockchain database. Uh, we're gonna do the same when it comes to space data, because as I'm sure you guys know, space market data is pretty much nowhere to be found. Um, we know how to do that. We know how to analyze it and we know how to service it. So in the short term or midterm, you're gonna see us come out with some kind of uh, subscription access to, to data sets and market data that we're generating. But our whole thing is to be the platform for space, the economic operating system for space assets, right? So our, our business isn't to be the sellers of space asset, but to facilitate uh, the commercialization of space assets. Roadmap, we move pretty fast for the space economy. Uh, it's funny, you know, I've, I've spent past X years in crypto and I, I talk to the space people who go, yeah, but you know, space moves pretty fast. I'm like, no, you guys don't. But uh, so I had a conversation with one VC actually, which really highlighted uh, the point that I was making around the space pool, which um, this is a very, very high profile investor in Silicon Valley. As people go, listen, we really love what you guys are doing. It's a big vision, et cetera. But, you know, we'd like to see some, some, some real, some revenue coming in, et cetera. Um, and this is for like a seed, 
you know, pre-seed seed investment. And they're saying this. I asked them, I go, hey, can you name me one space company that within a, in the entire history of space that within about a year of operation wants to launch product and earn revenue? And to their credit, unlike a lot of people I've asked this question to, they came back and they honestly said, you know what, we can't really find one. So I said, well, okay, then why are, why are we talking? You know, why are VCs entertaining this, this whole aspect? But the point is, is that for a space company, we move very fast. Uh, we released our initial iteration of the MVP, as you saw, you know, earlier in the where we are pretty much aspect. We have a great list of, of signed commercial, you know, space companies to do this. We have a great hit rate and kind of early commitment rate with space companies, actually. And right now we're in this pre-seed funding uh, stage and we're going to be launching a new website over the next week or so. Um, and also that first uh, marketplace for those alternative space assets. We're already kind of doing that, but you see that there with the space NFT gallery launch, right? Uh, and you can look on future into, you know, when we're launching, but generally beginning of last the next year, uh, you're going to see like a full on product out. All right. And why are we able to do this? Uh, James got into a little bit. Uh, I'm third generation, technically fourth generation um, aviation. Aerospace didn't exist then. So I'm third generation aerospace. Uh, the picture in the bottom left corner, the person standing there in the middle, he is the genesis for all of this. That's my grandfather. He was an aerospace professor at the Polish Air Force. And he's the first person I know of. I have these journals in storage. He's the first person I know of that wrote about democratization of space, right? Because he was actually dealing with it. He couldn't access the assets that he needed or his students needed, right? Um, and just last a little bit there, that picture with you see those paintings, there's an actually rocket launching in the back. And those are students at Lompoc High School where Lady Rocket Foundation, we do a lot of work at Lompoc High School, which is where Vandenberg Air Force Base is. And that's the first ever uh, art exhibition at a rocket launch, right? So we do a lot of, we're very community driven uh, with this stuff. You know, we have a lot of authenticity. We're not some people who are just trying to shove crypto into space. We've invested decades of ourselves and our personal finance to, to be on the ground in the space economy. And here's a little bit more from the team. Uh, so you know who we are. Uh, you can see our CFO, he's also at OTB. OTB is invested into satellite companies like uh, iSci. And then you see Lady Rocket, who's my mother actually as well. And the co-founder of this, who's been on the ground for a long time. And you see some other key team members. Some of them I brought in from CoinFirm where I've worked with them successfully already for years on some of the more kind of complex uh, blockchain based products you could think of, which are analytics engines. Um, and here's some of our partners. If you want, you can find us, NASA hosts us on their site permanently. So if you look up Copernic Space, you can find like an old, old deck of ours from when I presented to them. And, and here's the important kicker, you know, when I presented NASA and, and DOD and stuff, I said, hey guys, listen, I have, you know, platform models, cases here that will be extremely beneficial for you in the future and revolutionize how you better monetize assets that you have. I mean, I think NASA is one of the least used uh, organizations when it comes to assets, even media that I've ever seen in my life. Um, so we want to provide, for example, the capability for NASA to auction intellectual property uh, and patents. Uh, publicly through blockchain, right? Uh, and you see some of our other great, great partners there um, as well. Um, I would love anybody here who's interested to go and uh, follow Copernic Space across any social media. You can sign up for our waiting list and newsletter on copernicspace.com as well. Um, but over here, um, here's our Twitter. If you want to go to at Copernic Space, that's the tag across any social media. Uh, and if you want to find me, then you can find me as at GB Savant uh, across pretty much any social media or just my name and last name, you know, off LinkedIn, um, et cetera. And I want to thank you guys uh, once again for the time. Come on here and spit a little bit about what we're up to and what we're doing. And, um, you know, I welcome any sort of questions. Thank you, Grant. Thanks for sharing all that. Um, one question I have, 
how can uh, the Mars coin ecosystem work well with Copernic space? How can we leverage uh, what you're doing? Well, once uh, two things to that. You heard the our cross chain ability. So we're not. We want to allow as many protocols or asset structures to be able to be onboarded onto the platform or into our, our uh, ecosystem, so to say. So um, that's one message to that is that we would be open, obviously, to explore that from that end. You know, once again, I, we view ourselves as the economic operating system for the space economy in general, right? You guys seem to be focused on a specific aspect, which is going to be huge, obviously, but a specific aspect of the space economy and future of the space economy, right? Which, which I love, which is like, you know, which why I like the previous discussion. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot. Uh, maybe it was Matt who was speaking. Matt Wise, yeah. Yeah, why I really like that is because that's illustrating, you know, like Mars will be treated, my guess is that Mars will be treated like a nation, right, eventually. Right, and that nation will have its currency. That nation will have its operations, right? That nations will have its laws. Um, so what I would view us as is, let's say uh, Mars wants to, or the Mars coin has some sort of assets. It wants to commercialize on a wider market. You just transfer that onto the Copernic space marketplace. And then let's say uh, Mercury coin, you know, can come in, they go, oh, I really like that. And they can acquire that. Um, also, you know, who knows, maybe we would be, you know, the financing gateway for projects on Mars coin, right? I think it's, it's really, you know, once again, we're here to facilitate. We're not here to be the asset itself. Um, so really, I think it's a matter of us sitting down and picking out some kind of low hanging fruit cases uh, that could work. I just don't understand well enough the, the technicalities and, and all the kind of moving parts you guys have to give you a direct answer. But one of our thing is to really break down barriers, be open, be collaborative, um, and provide value to all participants in the space economy. Uh, you know, whether it's individuals who are here or whether it's an organization like MarsCoin. So I'm happy to have follow up discussions with whoever you deem best for that, James. Okay, awesome. Um, you mentioned during your presentation that you don't want to use Ethereum and their blockchain because I guess you said scalability concerns. What what would be a better alternative for that for you guys for than Ethereum? Uh, you know, like I spoke to the CTO of Cardano the other week. We're exploring all this sort of stuff. I'm not going to give a steady answer um, to it. You know, we could like there's so many different things that can be done, right? The reason I say that we won't do Ethereum, we might do some stuff on Ethereum. Like for example, the, the, the NFT collectibles, like we, the satellite Rhino thing, we did that on Ethereum, right? So I think it's more about the exact case and what it applies to. Um, but we're working with, once again, we have this sub protocol partner that we're working with right now uh, to where these assets can move across chains and it doesn't really matter what we're doing, right? So I, I can't give you an exact answer to that. Uh, as you see, we have the set launch within six months. To be honest, when you're talking to most of these protocols, they pretty much have copy and paste infrastructure if you're building it on EVM. Right. So a lot of those protocols are working really hard so that if you are on Ethereum or developing around that, that you can just transfer it on their, their chain. A question from Eva, and I think you just mentioned the satellite Rhino NFT. So can you tell us more about that as a new way to finance satellite ventures and uh, space philanthropy? Yeah, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a cool case. And we're, we're really trying to set once again, these standards and these precedents. Uh, we did it previously before with the first ever space art NFT exhibition. We did that in Palm Beach. And, and this time we're, from what we're doing, we're doing the first space and humanitarian initiative that leverages NFTs. So it's not like a financing round. What we're doing is we're creating this alternative space asset, putting it out to the market and putting it a big mission and you know, 
you know, big humanitarian aspect behind it so that uh, entities like Saving the Survivors aren't doing the traditional way of fundraising. They can potentially sell an NFT for a million dollars and then, you know, have to not give up anything really of their own to do so and then use those funds, facilitate that for, you know, better satellite data access. And in this case, also, they're going to use some of the funds to build the first on the ground emergency hospital for rhinos over there. And um, there's space companies that are approaching us for the same thing, which goes, hey, we have a passionate community, a passionate user base, and we have these kind of collectible items. And we want to figure out how we can monetize them through our community. Right. So I'm working with some space companies on on how to do that, which once again is alternative modes of financing space ventures in the space economy at the end of the day. Right. Just like we've seen, uh, you know, artists do it. Artists can take even a physical work that they have. They can create a digital aspect of it and they can monetize that in a different way. Right. Um, so like I said in the beginning of the presentation, we're going to see a lot of these like these digital media e-commerce models these models are going to look very similar in the space economy as well. Okay. And then last question. Um, recently you met with Elon Musk and he responded to you, I guess, with a Mars rocket IP offer. Can you tell us more about that conversation you had? Yeah. So uh, I had the privilege to go and, and check out SpaceX and ask a few questions to, uh, who was the head of NASA then, Jim. Jim Bridenstine. Yeah, to Jim and to Elon. And there's a video of this. Um, if you want, I can I can share it in the in the chat once I get off. Sure. Uh, where, you know, no matter what Elon says, Elon's a crypto noob. Like you can tell that by certain things he's doing. And remember what I told you about the, the space pool, the liquidity pool? My personal belief is that he's playing this game in the crypto market to figure out how he can leverage it to provide better liquidity for his missions, really. I think that's what he's doing it. But what I asked him, because what they were doing there is, you know, they're exchanging intellectual property, right? NASA and SpaceX going back and forth, right? And they're, they're creating new intellectual property. You know, and that, Musk has always said, you know, we'll make our stuff public. If you can build a better one, then show me, right? And so my question of them was twofold was one, Hey, you guys are trading all this IP. How are you doing this securely? And how are you going to make this IP securely available to other entities or to the public? And the second one is goes, are you looking at blockchain for any sort of alternative financing methods towards what you guys are doing? I asked it in a little bit more complicated way, but those are generally the questions to them. Uh, Musk, Musk made a historic statement. There's an article based off his answer because there was some media around me when I asked him that. Uh, and he said, we will make all SpaceX IP, uh, all SpaceX IP we gave to NASA, they can do whatever they want with it and make it public. Right? Um, which is a historic statement. Um, the other half of uh, Jim, Jim went into it a little bit more and he starts speaking about, you know, kind of these security specifics, national security concerns around making certain things accessible, certain things not accessible, which once again, what we've built as a platform provides that, right? Even in our MVP, you can geoblock Chinese entities because we KYC anything that's coming on, right? And then we KYM them, their whatever assets they want to register, right? So we actually provide that capability. So we have some initial interest from more kind of governmental or, or kind of larger organizations to kind of create what I call like private Copernic space marketplaces, right? Let's say Boeing wants to manage all of its providers and, and et cetera in one place and manage it there. So Space Force, same idea, right? You just saw Space Force wants to create a marketplace for space data between satellites, right? So we, once again, we view ourselves as the economic operating system for space assets. So I, you know, I want to call Musk out again pretty soon and say, hey, where the hell is this stuff? You know, let's, let's see it. Okay. Well, well, we'd love to hear more about that <laughs> if you do that. 
Um, well, thank you so much, Grant. This is really great. I learned a lot from your presentation and good luck with your venture, Copernic Space. And uh, thanks a lot for participating in our expo today. Thanks for having me, James.